I wanted to thank you for taking your time today to help some of these these young, eager minds to learn some of the real stuff about uh, becoming a, a strength coach. And I, are you familiar with uh, Jeff Young? He's a uh, I don't think he got his PhD. Do you know who he is? Uh, you know, I, I, I feel like I recognize um, the name and the screen and the profile, but that's, that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not totally f too familiar with him, but uh, I don't, I don't know if he's a, if he was a I, professor. I do, I do recognize What's that? Yeah, I don't know if he was a professor or, you know, what that even the word kinesiologist means today. But all, all I know is that he he went to he was at Penn State under Kramer. And so then he went to UConn. And so he's definitely a little older than me. But I thought that his you know, he, he puts a lot of great stuff out there. And today's post was pretty good. He says, I, I hear people say, you know, he or she, he or she is CS, CSCS. So they must know how to program design for athletes. And then he just kind of goes into like, well, that's actually uh, not that true. And I thought it was a good, you know, intro into what we're going to talk about today of going over some of these questions because the CSES, they do pride themselves in being the gold standard. But I think the big elephant in the room is they still don't have the hands-on learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The CSES really is like a oh god it's almost like a weeding out course in a in a college program right like um i don't know you want to go into to med into like pre med so you have to get through say organic chemistry right and organic chemistry is that that course that kind of like weeds you out reads out to people who are serious about learning the material and studying and um, intelligence, if you want to call it that, um, versus uh, those that are, are not serious. It's, it's just a test of like very baseline foundational knowledge. That's and that's really all the CSCS is, is like, do you have the foundation to build on to actually be able to, to do this job. But in terms of preparation to coach, to design programs, it really isn't providing you with that knowledge or experience. And I love that because that's, you know, that's what we're trying to build on here. So we want to be able to get the yin and the yang. And for me going to, I wanted to go to PT school. That was my, my thing. But the weeding out class for getting the, the idiots out there was physics. And that get the, got the idiot out of there because I couldn't pass that fucker. That was the – I think I took it three times. And I even I even cheated through one of them, and I still couldn't get through it. But, <laughs> but you know, I appreciate you taking your time today. So this is, um, this is Doc. He's uh, – can you give him, like, a quick little elevator speech on, you know, where you're at now because you've gone a couple of different universities and I don't want to butcher anything. No, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll do, uh, I'll do the life cycle in, in a rundown. Right. So undergrad was communications, marketing, terrible undergrad really didn't give a shit. Just wanted to drink and lift and, uh, and, and try and get ladies. And I definitely, failed at uh, everything except maybe the first two. Um, barely got out with a degree, got out, did some sales, was in the mortgage industry. Um, and I would, I would spend half my day uh, writing bodybuilding programs for myself and like on the message forums, reading about bodybuilding. Uh, and so it wasn't for me. Uh, so then I like, had a little epiphany and decided that I was going to become a strength coach. Um, took some classes, non-matriculating to prove that I wasn't a, a jerk off. I was an undergrad. Started off uh, on my road to getting a master's. Kind of fell in love with the science more than the coaching. Um, and uh, got carried away, got a PhD from Springfield College, taught for a year at the University of Kentucky on a temporary teaching contract, 
Uh, then I was at Coastal Carolina as a professor for seven years, and now I am at Lynchburg, uh, sorry, University of Lynchburg um, presently, and I've been there for a semester and a half, or semester and three weeks. Got it, and we met at the ISSN, and I think for trainers to, if, you, if you've never been involved in the, the scientific aspect, you, it's just good to be around, I'm not putting myself on any means on the same category as Doc here, where like he's eons above me. But, you know, just when you're around like-minded folk who are involved in the research. So when people say, I did my research, you're going to learn that they didn't do their fucking research. <laughs> and, and so, you know, we're excited to have them help out today. And we appreciate you. And, you know, some of the stuff that we were going over when we were doing these review questions, they were definitely more advanced. I, and I, I don't want to overstep my boundaries and, and stuff that I don't know exactly. So I wanted to uh, bring these in here and, and ask them. And then, you know, what we did in the past, if this is all right with you, I kind of read the question to see if the students can get it. And then we can kind of go over, you know, just some tidbits on the, maybe the, any other things that you want to add in there. Does that work for you? Um, yeah, yeah. So the first one, guys, we got... Uh, as compared to males, the potential for force production of females per muscle cross sectional areas is lower, similar, or higher? B. Jimmer? Yeah, B is, B is correct. Uh, now, now, why yeah. is that? Well, because muscle is muscle and human muscle is human muscle. There's no difference structurally or functionally uh, between male muscle tissue or female muscle tissue. Now, that may seem a little bit, uh, I don't know, the opposite of, of what we might observe or seem obvious, right? Because uh, males tend to be stronger than females, uh, generally speaking. And you know, certainly if you look at the, the highest echelons of sports, right? The, the, you know, if you're comparing, say, I don't know, 80 kilogram power lifters, then male 80 kilogram power lifters are putting up higher numbers than female 80 kilogram power lifters. And male 100 meter sprinters at, at the Olympic level are faster than female 100 meter sprinters. Um, but, but that's looking at the, the whole human being. But when you look at the actual muscle tissue, there's no difference. Now, probably the biggest way to explain those differences are gonna be in, uh, in anthropometrics. Um, are you familiar with what's called the Q angle? And stop me like if I'm going into, you know, detail that's irrelevant to this. That's good. We, we've talked about it in class. With All right. The, so are you familiar with what, what's known as the Q angle? Okay. Yeah. I'm going to butcher this because I'm not a, a biomechanist a little bit, but I'm going to bring you to my board here. And uh, can you see it okay? That's fine. Yeah, I can see. All right. So we have the... The hips, the knees, and the feet, right? And so the Q angle is this angle between the hips and knees. If you were to draw a straight line up, that right there is known as the Q angle. Now, the Q angle in women is greater than the Q angle in men due to wider hips, generally speaking, of course. Uh, this, this predisposes women to, as, you, as you're probably aware, uh, a higher risk or higher incidence of uh, ACL injuries. Well, in terms of force production, it also makes the force production from the hip musculature and the quadriceps into the ground, which would occur when you are sprinting, squatting, powerlifting, etc., less efficient. 
So the amount of force being produced in those muscles is relatively the same amount per unit of, uh, of cross-sectional area. However, the transfer of that force into the ground or into um, an opponent in sports or whatever the case is, is gonna be less efficient, leading to slower 100 meter sprint times and slightly lower uh, squats and deadlifts. And the same thing is occurring uh, at the elbow joint as well. So these small differences in anthropometrics explain uh, quite a bit of uh, the difference in uh, performance in terms of strength and power between males and females. But when you look at the muscle tissue, the muscle tissue is the same. Well, thank you. So which of this was- so it's, it's wider, basically a wider head. What's that? Sorry, I said, so basically it's wider hips for the squat, which is what, uh, impacting the speed of the sprint and then the ability to transfer power to the ground. Yeah, that, that is one, sure of the, the one of the reasons why. That, well, it's the angle between the femur and the hip joint. So the femur is coming at a slightly right. greater okay. angle due to wider hips, yeah. And then the elbow is similar because of why again, sorry. The, uh, so the Q angle at the elbow, I don't recall exactly what the Q angle at the elbow is, but I was reading a few papers on, on the topic, on the subject back, uh, it, was, it was in regards to uh, trans women participating in, in cisgender female sports and everything and whether there was uh, right. you know, an advantage or not, and whether that posed an issue for safety. It was really just a Facebook discussion. So it wasn't anything uh, that I was working on that was scholarly, but I was reading scholarly papers and peer reviewed papers. And so that was one of the things that I came across was not just the Q angle in the knees, but also uh, the anthropometrics of the upper body make the, the transfer of force a little bit less efficient. Yeah, so we, were, you know, we were talking about this in the um, in the context of MMA, so throwing a punch and whether there would be an advantage there or not. Uh, you know, most people seem to think it has something to do with testosterone. It really, really, in terms of males and females and differences in, uh, in strength, it really doesn't. Hmm. Well, this is the, the one that I wanted to learn more about as well, because this is when you get to the... The, the, the details on the sarcomere and how a muscle contracts. So which of the following events occurs in the hamstring muscles during concentric muscle action of the leg or knee curl exercise? So we've got the A band length increases, the I band length stays the same, the H zone length decreases. Jimmy, what do you think? I saw I got John. B. Yeah. We're gonna, we're gonna go with which one? B. And yeah, same. So, do you want to help us with this one, Doc? C. Yeah, it is C. Um, okay. We got to go back up to uh, to my board for this. See if I can get my laptop a little bit closer. Are you sure? <laughs> so we, the C was what? H zone decreases? H zone decreases? Yep, that yeah. was the C was? So what we're, what we're gonna be looking at here is the structure of a sarcomere. Hmm. All right, so I'm not sure of a sarcomere. Oh, there it is. Fuck. 
um, sarcomere is the, the basic uh, component of contraction within the muscle fibers. Um, and it makes up each microfibril. So uh, this is going to be a very basic 2D drawing, but it's going to be a little more complex if you were to look at it other ways. But we're going to draw it very simply to uh, um, Let me know if he says the Xenon's report together. So we have, we don't even need this one. Uh, my rag go. So the, these blue fibrils here are active. The red, myosin, myosin, yep. And then you have the, the Z disc, the Z line, Z line, yep, and some titan that kind of holds it all together. And so the A band is the myosin. It's going to be dark if you were to put it under a, a microscope, right? So that's your A band. That's the myosin. Your H zone is the space in the middle. And then your I band is going to be the space of just active. So if we draw another, uh, another sarcomere next to it, this area from the end of one myosin to the end of the other, that is just acting the I band. And so to fully understand this question, you need to understand what's known as the, uh, the sliding filament theory of muscular contraction. And basically what that sliding filament theory says is that the, the myosin cross bridge, the myosin heads form cross bridges with the actin. And in doing so, they pull the actin toward the center. And each myosin will pull it towards the center. That center is also called the M line. So each actin is going to pull it toward the center, and, or each myosin is going to pull it towards the center, excuse me. And as it does so, sarcomere is going to shorten. And all those sarcomeres arranged in series, or one after another after another, along of the, the length of the myofibril are going to shorten, causing the muscle to shorten and therefore contract. Okay. So as this happens, um, we'll take this one and we'll leave it relaxed and then we'll use this one and draw it, what would happen uh, as it contracts so you can see the difference. Now, if this was fully contracted, it would look something like this. I should note that the, the myofibrils, the filaments, the actin and the myosin, their length does not change. So this would look... Right. They just get closer together, right? Yeah, it would, it would draw them in. So what's happening is the H zone disappears. The I band significantly shortens. 
but the A band stays the same. Learn something new every day. And use that those lines to pick up girls at the so bar next time. <laughs> so like with the book, it like yeah. disappear it disappears here. The can you see that? Yeah. The the I band looks like it disappears, is why yeah. I, but but then when I read it says it decrease it or it looks like it stays the same, but it decreases its sense. Is why I was if you look at the photo, it's a little bit different than what I guess I imagined. Because in the one in the like the last picture where it's completely contracted, there is no I band. Like it's just the A band up at the top. Right. The two I bands are like gone, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, it, it, they, they decrease and uh Does the I band completely? Does it completely go away? I don't honestly know the answer to okay. that. I think you would need to look at a fully contracted muscle fiber underneath okay. the microscope to determine because the the way it like if you put it underneath the microscope, what happens is these myosins are very thick. These atoms are very thin. So if you look at muscle under a microscope, they call it striated. Okay. Yeah. You'll have these these lines essentially that are dark where light doesn't come through, that are light where the actin is where light does come through. Okay. A band being dark, I band being light. So whether that actin contracts, whether that myosin contracts all the way that the ends are touching, or whether there's a little bit of space in between, I'm not totally sure. Okay. Off the top of my head. We got okay. that one now. Let's move on to kind of going off of kind of similar with the muscle contractions. What we have, which of the following muscle actions produces the greatest amount of force? Eccentric, concentric, or isometric? Yeah, B. That's what I think. I think it's B. So I'm going to ask you a question before you end, and I want you to answer it again. What do you think? You guys bench press, right? Yeah. All right, cool. So I can use bench mm -hmm. press as, a, as an example. Now, what do you, when you bench press, can you press more weight up? Do you think you could hold more weight halfway? Or do you think you could use more weight and lower it slowly to your chest? Which do you think you uh, could most weight? Ethan Turk. Yeah. yeah. Pushing it away. Pushing nope. it away. Uh, I think bringing it down, Ethan Turk, because whenever I hit a plateau, I'm able to handle more weight coming down to break down my muscle and then eventually get stronger later. Yes. So eccentric would be the greatest amount of or being able to control more weight, right? Yeah, that's correct, right? You think about like doing a set to just a brutal set to true failure, right? And you're going, you're going, you're going, ah, you can't really press it up anymore. And then you're completely, completely masochistic. So you hold it as long as you can, then you can't really hold it anymore, then you can slowly lower it, right? Your, your eccentric is gonna fatigue last. So you can, you have the most force production eccentrically. Now, now, Doc, how does that, I've always been intrigued, the scientific rationale for, you know, I've seen some, you know, sightings that like you're eccentrically stronger, you know, 20% to as high as 60%. Like the other day I did, a one RM, a hundred pound chin up where I could eccentrically come down 160. How does the eccentric transfer over concentrically so you're able to produce more concentrically in the future? Because I found that's one of the best ways to help produce strength with new clients. It's like you bring them 10, 20% above their, their one rep max, they're able to get to their one rep max so much quicker. Yeah. Uh... I can offer up uh, a few theories for that, but I can't give you a um, an, uh, an absolute answer. 
I'm not sure, but uh, one is going to be um, kind of a cognitive effect, right? Where you are just showing the client what type of weight they can hold in their hands and not hurt themselves. So if you're working with someone who is, uh, who's relatively new and they look at 100 pounds and it scares them, but you can get them just like to lift that bar off for a squat and step back with it. Now they realize that weight isn't gonna crush them and it builds their confidence. Or with the bench press, same thing, unracking a lot of weight, having them lower it down and then you helping them, you know, get it back up. And so you're, you're building a level of, of, of confidence in the weight, in the load, in the movement that otherwise you wouldn't be able to. So that's one theory, right? The other theory is um, also neurological in nature, uh, building those, those movement patterns in the, in, in the, uh, in the eccentric movement. Um, and then also uh, physiological or, or muscular, I should say, um, eccentric is really overloading those, those muscle fibers. Um, and although eccentric only probably isn't going to stimulate more uh, protein synthesis, um, you know, heavy eccentrics uh, may lead to a little bit more, more muscle growth. Uh, but also heavy eccentrics are going to have the greatest impact upon connective tissue uh, strength, for lack of a better term. So all three of those things probably factor in, in terms of improving, uh, improving strength with eccentric training. Great. I love it. Um, now, this is the, I think last week they asked me on this one. I said, nope, stop. I'm not a biomechanist. I the levers. I fucking hate, I'll be honest with you. So <laughs> with the following exercises is, is an example of a first class lever. I know the answer, but I don't, I couldn't tell you the rationale behind it. And that's what I wanted to see if we can get some help with. So we have tricep push down, lateral raise, bicep curl. Would you guys choose for it? I think it's A. And, you know, having, having trouble with levers, I think this is, I think that's what the, I'm, Guessing this is what the tricep raise is, but with first class, the 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 weight and the the fulcrum have to be on the opposite sides. If I'm correct, so like with the lateral, so the, here's your fulcrum and the weights on this side instead of this side. Well, also, Jonathan, what, right? John, what they're talking about it, it's here though. This is the tricep push down. Oh shit! Okay. You're correct. So, uh, yeah. You are correct with the rationale and the right answer, but he's going to explain to you right now why. Okay. Uh, yeah, you're right. First class lever, the force, which would be where the muscle tendon connects and the load are on opposite sides of the joint, but the load is further away. Second class lever would be like a bicep curl where load and the force are on the same side of the lever. And then the third one, which is a th or third class, is going to be where the on opposite sides, but the load is closer to the fulcrum and the force. So in this case, you're at the greatest mechanical disadvantage because the load is further away from the fulcrum than the force is. Also a mechanical advantage, disadvantage because the load is greater way than the force. But with a third class lever, the load is closer to the fulcrum than the force. So you're at a mechanical advantage. Okay. I don't know why a lateral raise isn't considered a first class lever either, in addition to a tricep press down. Lateral raise, right? 
Here's the, here's the fulcrum on the shoulder. Here's the deltoid. Well, I guess it's, yeah, I guess it's con technically connected to the same side. So that would be a second class as well. Now that I think about it. Never mind. Yeah. So triceps first, lateral, second. Lateral and biceps would be second class levers. And then the. Uh, the calf raises? Yeah, the calf raises are your. Um, third class? Your typical third class, yeah. As I, I remember when I was studying a long time ago, they'd always use a wheelbarrow, wheelbarrow as an example to help you kind of understand the, the levers and stuff. And I already told you guys I failed physics, so that wasn't my thing. <laughs> the lever is in the body. You're going to be, most of them are at a mechanical disadvantage. So they're going to be first or seconds. Do you guys have any other questions on the, the levers? Here's a trick question. Okay. There's one muscle in the body that doesn't function as a lever. Anyone know what it is? Can you give us a hint? Yeah, you probably use it every day, many times a day. Tongue? What's that? The tongue? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just kind of floating around. Yeah, so it is. Is, is, the tongue. Tongue, is the tongue skeletal muscle? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, that's, that's a powerful little sucker right there. <laughs> All right, fellas, what do you guys think about this one? An increase in which of the following is a marker of aerobic overtraining? Body fat percentage, muscle glycogen, creatine kinase concentration. Yep. So, yeah. I was, I was creatine kinase, they measure that with a little bit with uh, like CK with like rhabdo, right? Is that one of the measures that they'll look at? Uh, rhabdo is usually myoglobin, but oh, so, myoglobin. Okay. Yeah, creatine kinase is just a a surrogate for uh, muscle damage. So we have, right, our muscle fiber, our blood vessel, and creatine kinase should be localized inside the muscle fiber. Creatine kinase facilitates the reaction of, uh, of uh, catabolizing phosphocreatine to produce ATP, or vice versa, catabolizing uh, uh, ATP to, to replenish phosphocreatine. But either way, it should be pretty, um, should be within the muscle. You shouldn't really be finding it in the blood. Okay. However, as a result of damaging exercise that causes microtrauma or little tears in the muscle cell membrane, some of this creatine kinase can leak out and end up in the blood. And that's why you can use it as a marker of muscle damage. Hmm. as an indirect marker of muscle damage. So like if there's more in your blood, it means you've got more muscle damage? Is that if what you're, you're seeing it in the blood, that means there's some level of muscle damage, correct? Okay. So it's kind of a dumb question on the NSCA's part because you, you could just do like a, well, you could expose yourself to some sort of unusual activity that causes muscle soreness and, uh, and see an increase in creatine kinase concentration without it being actual overtraining. See, that's why you bring him on here. You get the real nerdy shit. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, if you're used to, for example, let's say that you're uh, a runner, right? And you're used to running on flat ground. And then you do a race or you start training on hills. Well, that downhill movement uh, is is going to be a, 
a novel stress on the muscles. It's a novel eccentric movement. It's going to cause some muscle damage, maybe on your first or second or third runs. And that would lead to, you know, detectable creatine kinase within the blood. But that doesn't mean that you're overtrained. Could you just get that from progressive overload then? Yeah, in resistance like, training, it's, and it, it's pretty expected to see some creatine right, kinase yeah. following uh, a resistance training workout because you're causing a little bit of muscle damage. But it's, it's you know... I mean, you can kind of rule the other two out. Okay, uh, I don't even say an increase or decrease in muscle glycogen. So let's just say that you know there's there's plenty of muscle glycogen, so there's plenty of fuel. So that you wouldn't think there'd be a ton of fuel if the person was overtrained. And uh, oh, it does say an increase. I'm sorry. Uh, so an increase in fuel would not be, wouldn't be an indicator of overtraining. It'd be quite the opposite. Um, an increase of body fat percentage, again, probably an indicator that training volume has gone down or, uh, or the individual is uh, overeating or hypercaloric. So you can kind of rule those other two out on this question. But like, you know, in terms of muscle damage, that, that's kind of a, uh, a dumb question. <laughs> well, I was, uh, this was the, this was the one I got wrong. So if calcium is not returned to the SR or sarcoplasmic reticulum, which of the following best describes what occurs in the muscle? Fused tetany, flaccid paralysis, twitch summation. Uh, twitch? Not sure. John? Following just trying to look this. Plowers B. Doc? Well, we've already said it's fused tetany. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to learn a little bit more about what the fuck that is. Ah, <laughs> uh, it is a challenging one. Um, all right. Well, flaccid paralysis, I, I don't even, I'm not sure what that is. Um, you know, so I, I don't know. Uh, I actually wanted to look that up before we talk so that I could come familiar with it, but the day kind of got away from me. Uh, twitch summation is, here, here is a force on the vertical axis, and there is the frequency of twitches. So every time a, uh, every time an impulse from the central nervous system is sent to the muscle, it twitches, right? So a single impulse will cause the muscle to twitch. So imagine like a quick peck bounce, single impulse, and that muscle will twitch and you'll get a little bit of force increase. So like single peck bounce, boom, one twitch, one signal, one twitch. Then, Imagine that we do three signals in a row with a little bit of space in between them. And we'll have a twitch, we won't return to baseline, another twitch, won't return to baseline, another twitch. So imagine that as like three really quick peck bounces, right? Then it will rescind the signals at a very, very fast frequency one after another, after another, after another, you'll get what's called fused, or sorry, twitch summation, where all those many, many twitches will summate to reach a nice, smooth, high level of force. This is what happens during most of our physical activities, like a bench press. Your body, your central nervous system, I should say, is sending those impulses at a very fast rate. To, and that's twitch uh, summation. Force production. Then they all just sync up. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Okay. So fuse tetany? Uh, fuse tetany is occurring within the muscle, and that is when calcium is not being returned to the sarcoplasmic reticulum uh, in between muscle contractions. 
Okay. And then the other one is just a term that it's I, you, I don't know if there's any merit to the CSCS, but, you know, on a lot of other tests, I've I always used the, if I've never seen it before, I never choose it. So it's like that word I've never seen before. Oh my God. <laughs> I thought it was, I thought this I, one was uh, switch. I, I want to, uh, I want you to look that up for me. Flaccid paralysis. Really cool. You know, obviously my mind goes to flaccid. I'm thinking of a, a limp dick, but. Um, yeah. I mean, it's gotta be something to do with that. Well, you know that like rigor mortis is when the muscle is essentially in a very stiff state following uh, following death. So, I mean, it's just exactly what it says. It says flaccid paralysis is a neurological condition characterized by weakness of paralysis and reduced muscle tone without obvious cause or trauma. The condition may be caused by disease or trauma affecting the nerves associated with the muscles involved. All right. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, you, you snip the nerve that contracts the, the calf muscles and, and they're now in flaccid paralysis. They're really relaxed and they can't contract. That makes sense. Steve, we got a, we got a couple more for you. And then um, we can, we appreciate your time today. So we got a, a novice athlete has been following an aerobic endurance training program for a year. Which of the following is most likely to occur? Decrease in resting AVO2, decrease in maximal tidal volume, or increase in resting stroke volume? Hey. Hey. John? Hey. Doc, that one is going to be C. Oh, damn it. Ah, damn. <laughs> so let's look at okay. those differences. <laughs> you have the amount of oxygen, let's just say 20 milliliters per liter in the arterial blood. Then you have that blood divides into arterioles and the capillaries, supplying a tissue, let's just say the muscle tissue. And then you have the venous blood, which is returning that blood back to the heart so that it can be transferred, pumped to the lungs to, to be reoxygenated. So under resting conditions, usually you'll see about 16 milliliters per liter. Uh, in the venous blood. What this means is that the muscles extracted four milliliters of oxygen. That's your AVO2 difference. Under rest, this doesn't change. When you're exercising, this number goes up because your, your muscles are using more oxygen, so they're extracting more. So the amount of oxygen being extracted goes up. Therefore, the amount of oxygen in the venous blood being returned to the heart is gonna go down. Now, as a result of, of training, your muscles are able to extract even more oxygen. So you would see that amount of oxygen in the venous blood being even less. They become more efficient at extracting oxygen from the blood. So this is the AVO2 difference. Not much really changes in terms of our metabolic needs at rest, whether we are trained or untrained. Our tidal volume is dictated by our lung size and our lung size really doesn't change as a result of exercise training. There's not much we can do about that. On the other hand, exercise training increases the size of the heart. So let's say uh, the left ventricle pre-training can hold 100 milliliters of blood and exercise post-training 
can now hold 200 milliliters of blood. At resting conditions, we, we need the same amount of blood. Let's just say uh, six liters per minute. So now we're pumping 100 milliliters per beat times 60 beats per minute. And that gives us six milliliters per minute. We still, under resting conditions, only need six liters per minute. And these are just arbitrary numbers that I'm using, just for reference. I'm sorry, okay. Jack, I got to head out. I really appreciate everything, though. Okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. Right. Uh, so now our heart can pump twice as much blood per beat. So now we only need to pump 30 times per minute to give us that six liters. That's why people who are fit have lower resting heart rates than people who are unfit. Again, these are arbitrary numbers. So, you know, you're probably not gonna encounter very many people with a resting heart rate of, of 30. Uh, but, but I hope that illustrates the, the concept of, of why the stroke volume is gonna be greater under resting conditions because the heart is bigger and can pump more blood. It's also why heart rate goes down. All right, that makes a lot more sense too. All right, let's just do um, a female marathon who trains at sea level. She trains, travels to a race venue held at an altitude of one mile, isn't one mile, 5280? I don't know, 5280. Yeah, it's about 5,000 feet. Mm -hmm. Which of the following best describes the immediate physiological effects? So we have an increase in cardiac output, decrease in ventilation rate, or decrease in tidal volume? It's kind of going off like the, the, the prior one. What do you think, John? You're on mute, John. Uh, I'm going to say increase cardio output. Unless it's. Yeah, you, you got that. Oh, nice. <laughs> I, I just feel like the you're working harder in altitude, higher altitude. So that's why I picked that one. Yep, that's that's correct. Plus, you're at altitude, there's less oxygen in the blood, or sorry, there's less oxygen in the ambient air. So you're not going to breathe less. You're not going to breathe slo slower and shallower at altitude. You're going to breathe heavier at altitude. Totally. So you're definitely not going to see a decrease in breathing. But yeah, your heart's going to have to work a little bit harder to circulate more blood because there's going to be less oxygen in it. And two more quick ones on the more muscle stuff. So all innervated muscle fibers of a motor unit fully contracted when stimulated due to which of the following? So all innervated muscle fibers of a motor unit are fully contracted when stimulated due to Size principle, selective recruitment, or all or none principle? A little bit of muscle. C. Yeah, I, I chose this one also, Doc, to, for selfish reasons, because I wanted to get your um, quick little analysis on the reasoning behind, because selective recruitment is what happens with the stress shortening cycle in explosive and pyometric jumps, right? Where you only recruit type 2X, is that right? Uh, I'm actually not familiar with that, with that term, selective recruitment, but I would think so. I mean, one of the, one of the adaptations to, uh, to ballistic and explosive training, like plyometric training, is, uh, is you recruit those high threshold motor units. So those, those type, big type two motor units. Um, quicker and at, at lower force needs. So can you actually like, cause when I draw the size principle for students, I always use like a, like a volume analogy where you turn it up and it goes from zero to 10, 20, 30, 40, but you are able to skip 
type one recruitment when you do something explosive or? I don't, so I don't think that you, this is my understanding of it. Um, I could be wrong, but I don't think that you like skip type one recruitment. Let's say that you're, uh, you, you normally see like the motor units drawn like little, yeah. bigger, 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 like right, like that, okay? So, and then you recruit them based upon your force needs. Um, threshold. Right, your threshold. So the way that I understand this is maybe, again, completely arbitrary numbers to illustrate uh, a point. But the way I understand this is pre-training, so before doing really explosive training, maybe it takes you, let's say, let's just use a second, because that's a nice, even, stupid integer. So maybe it takes you one second to go from here, with zero force, to here, with maximal force. So it takes you one second to recruit all of these, to go from recruiting this one, to that one, to that one, to that one, to that one. That takes you one second. So your rate of force production is going to be whatever this maximal force being produced is when all of these are recruited divided by one second. Again, we'll keep the numbers nice and, and even and we'll say it's 100 newtons of force divided by one second gives you 100 newtons per second. That's your rate of force production. Now, let's say as a result of uh, explosive training, it now only takes you, again, arbitrary numbers just to illustrate a point, 0.5 seconds, right? To recruit this one, this one, this one, this one, this one to recruit all of them. Now it only takes you 0.5 seconds. So even if your force production hasn't changed, now you're generating 100 newtons in 0.5 seconds, which gives you a force production or a rate of force production of 200 newtons per second. Right? Power is, in, in very conceptual terms, strength times speed, or force times, uh, force times speed. So what you're seeing is greater power, right? Greater rate of force production. So that, that's, I think, how I would describe uh, selective recruitment to the best of my understanding. But neuromuscular physiology is, um, is not my strongest so it's not something that I, I study as, as much as uh, um, muscle fitness. So, well, I, I would say that made good sense to me. <laughs> Just wanted enough on this last one, and then uh, John, all, all to, so to allow for all to allow for cross bridge interactions during muscular contractions, calcium must bind with which of the following: troponin, tropomyosin, or actin. C. Doc? Uh, that would be troponin. Fuck. <laughs> and so last, and then this is more your wheelhouse with the uh, physiology stuff, so. Yeah. Um, it was troponin. I always get troponin and tropomyosin confused. Yep, it was troponin. All right. All right, so you had that, that actin filament. Let's just say, it actually just looks like a, kind of like a string of beads is what it looks like. And then you have troponin, or underneath it, I, I should say, is this active binding site on each one. And so you have troponin, which is this globules. And then the tropomyosin, which is more of a string that covers each active binding site. 
when calcium binds to troponin, this happens. Troponin, it says to roll over, or it has a conformational change of shape. We're just going to say that it rolls over. So when calcium binds to it, the troponin essentially rolls over, right? Each one rolls over. Here's your tropomyosin. And now those active binding sites are exposed. And once they're exposed, the myosin crossbridge heads immediately, uh, the myosin heads immediately grab hold, forming a, what's called a crossbridge. And then they execute a power stroke, yanking that actin toward the M line. Any questions on that, John? You're getting uh, sliding filament theory here in, uh, in a little cliff notes, but this, this physiology stuff is all fascinating when, you're, when you actually get it explained to in a, in a good way like this. Definitely. And so, well, that's, uh, that was awesome, Doc. I, I'll, I'll chat with you on a one-off. On Did you have any other questions, John? Or No, no. Uh, are we going to do Wednesdays at 11 or – no, just today, we'll, I know you have to go back to work, so I'll, I'll chat with you more to see okay. how we can get these going for you, and we'll, we'll get some. Uh, so I had to do this a little earlier today, but I appreciate you hopping on here. And yeah. I know you get to hop on a call here too soon, right, Doc? Thank you, Jason. Yeah, you're very welcome. Uh, my pleasure. This puts me in a good mood for a uh, faculty meeting, which always makes me want to drink, so I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick you guys off real quick, and I'm going to chat with him just for a couple minutes. All right, I got a, I got a minute for you, so good. Yeah, that's what I wanted. So, um, yeah, I appreciate your time. I'm, I I would love to, um, you know, we could do this, you know, when you have time. But uh, as we grow this right now, our online, we have over 230 people, and it's generating a decent awesome. amount of revenue. And so yeah. we want to do the same with the CSCS. And I'll I'll definitely – this first trial was a month for free, but we're going to get people in here, and I'll be able to start compensating you and thanking you for your time. I, I know that you're not doing it for the compensation part, but you know, it's, it's really helpful for us. And uh, this, this time is very valuable for me, and I know that your time's valuable. So I appreciate you helping us out and uh, looking forward to you know, building something a little bigger in the future. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, you know, we can, we can probably get this going at least bi-weekly, if not weekly. So. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's – I'm going to get a marketing group behind us to start. I mean, uh, it's crazy. The, the competition we have is this DPT student and he's just a fucking nerd and it's cool and all, but it's like, you need to bridge that gap. And it's like, I was showing you earlier, it's like, you, if you can't communicate with an athlete, if you're going to start breaking down all this, it's like, yeah, these nerds have never worked with athletes. So like, you have to have yeah. this, this marriage where you get, you can be like a bro. And I always say that with respect. I mean, you're a bro, you can yeah. speak bro, but then you're smart too. So yeah, right on. Hey, I, I gotta, I gotta hop on this. Okay, uh, we'll see it.